Scarecrow walks out of a restaurant and says, Boy, I'm stuffed. Mm. This time, on the Face for Wrestling audio podcast, we bring to you NXT TakeOver number one. I, as ever, am co-host number two, The Matt, joined by co-host number three. I'm Waldo. And co-host number one, Dr. Brian. What's going on, Doctor? Doctor? Words to live by. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the show. So here we are, our second podcast that we're attempting here for NXT The First Takeover, titled NXT TakeOver. Well, we're not attempting. At- we're actually doing it. Oh, Whether yeah. Whether or not it's-, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, it took place on 29th of May in 2014 at the Full Sail Arena. Had about the same attendance as last time, uh, about 400, and the tickets averaged about 15 bucks a piece. I, I, sooner or later, I'm going to go get a copy of all the posters that they had for the uh, full sale events. Mm-hmm. I saw an eBay listing, and I've actually got a bid in for it. There's a pack of um, all the NXT events that were done in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, you remember when we went to that one indie event, and they had that poster we got signed by everybody, yep. including Keith Lee? Yes. It's it's one of those, nice. but they've got a pack of all of them that have taken place in the U.S. so far. Nice. Up until, I want to say like a couple of months ago. Right. That's so, not bad at all. Yeah, and, and on there it even says uh, this time versus last time that general admission is $15. All right, it's not anymore. Yeah, no, it's not anymore because they're not doing them at full sale anymore. Now, I know they still do the tapings for the weekly show mm-hmm. over at full sale, any event over there is basically priced at school prices. Right. Now, you I do get a student make... discount? Yes. Students uh, that go to Full Sail do get a discount. Nice. I want to say that if you're in the business entertainment program, and mm-hmm. this is because I've emailed the school already, that you will actually get in. If you're in that program working with the NXT event, you get free tickets. Nice. Now, as far as like who takes advantage of this and everything, I haven't heard back because I, I would, would. imagine – yeah. Oh, yeah. I would too. I mean, but we're wrestling fans. So you, that's the thing. It's like most colleges nowadays. You got college under your belt. I've got some under my belt. Not a lot of people are wrestling fans in the universities or openly admit it because oh, that would not be you know kosher. Of right. Me to... But even as a college student, though, like if you're if you you know you ain't got a lot of cash in your pocket when you're young and dumb and stuff, you might go just for the sake of hey, it's something to do on a whatever night they're filming. No, I would. I mean, I've done worse uh, like I mean, the company that's the worst company in the world tna they used to make a lot of good money when they were stationed just in what was it universal yeah they were doing the whole wcw trick when they first started yeah because they'd have a lot of looky loos come in that like i don't know what this is let me go see what it is so like i could definitely see w- working out of a college campus now plus... that's a little bit different because even back when wcw was doing it i think they had the same deal with Universal that Bischoff first started, which was if you had a general admission pass to Universal Studios for the day, Mm -hmm. you could be shuffled in and out for one of their tapings under that ticket. Right. So WCW and then later Impact, all these years later, when they did their tapings at Universal, they would get paid a flat rate from the studio to tape in there, but it wasn't, for neither company, it was enough to cover the production costs. So it was basically just to get them on the map. Yeah. Whereas at Full Sail, you're actually charging people to come in, and even though it's not covering the production costs, you are bringing in some money. Yeah. Now, that being said, for Full Sail, at this point, and it'd be a long time after this, right now, NXT's not producing a profit. They are strictly there for developmental to get the talent on a tv screen to see how they would react with a larger audience than what they would be used to in a independent environment yeah we talked we we talked about keith lee for a second he's with nxt now we've had the privilege of seeing keith lee at a couple of events live in the states at independent showings and i'll i'll be the first to tell you they had a good crowd for that event but they didn't have nowhere near the amount of people that full sale was able to hold no and they weren't set up that way and they weren't on TV or anything like that either. Yeah. You could catch him on streaming for Facebook or YouTube or I think even Twitch is what he does. But whereas NXT, they do weekly TV for the WWE Network. Yeah. And eventually, if they make it, they'll be on the specials that they have. Now, that's one thing that I want to point out during this pay-per-view is that 
Tom Phillips, who's one of our announcers tonight, with Lord Regal, and I, I, it says I got written here Byron Saxton, but man, I barely heard him throughout the entire pay per view. Yeah, I don't really remember him much in this one. He said a couple of things, and then he, Regal was real quick to sandbag him and just let there be like five or six seconds of dead air whenever Saxton said something. But it was better this time around because he was he did take the hint. Yeah. Specifically, I want to say Phillips was saying that this was an NXT special and not Mm -hmm. a pay-per-view. Yes. And that makes sense because it's not like you're going to DirecTV or whoever your provider is at the time and saying, hey, I want to order the NXT pay-per-view because then it would be, you know, 60 bucks per event instead of nine ninety nine. Yeah. Well, and that's what I was going to point out when you were saying that they're doing this strictly to get them on TV. They're also doing it for content for the network. Which is good. We recently saw, for reasons unknown to us and the rest of the wrestling world, Evolve was having their 10th anniversary on the WWE Network. Yeah, well, they have a working uh, relationship with the Fed. And they have for they, a bit. Yeah, yeah. They sent a lot of talent that way. I think it's all set up through uh, Regal, actually. I know Regal did a lot of work with them when they first started the – not work – because like they don't take evolve talent and put them on the roster anywhere, but a lot of the old, a lot of the NXT stars did come from evolve, and that's why they work that special and everything. But it's it's yeah, it's a weird thing. It's kind of like the old ECW days where they would send people down to ECW to train and stuff. Only it's not for training; it's to actually give evolve the rub. Yeah, I was going to mention that it's very similar to the ECW setup that they had. I want to say in the early, late '90s, early 2000s, and also maybe like OVW with Jim Cornette. Yeah, definitely OVW esque. So this pay per view took place on 29th of May. Yep. It was about three months after their first special NXT arrival. Fun fact: It would take us this long to record the second episode. Yes, it it was hectic. There was snow. There was goblins. There were battles. This is also the first NXT special on the network that would use the takeover name and would later on become a staple in how they would name their events, almost reminiscent to the In Your House pay-per-views. Yes. I think everyone, except for maybe a couple Japanese specials, have the takeover name in them. Uh, there's a out. few more. We'll We'll talk about one of them later that's coming up that doesn't have the takeover name overall the show would go about roughly 75 minutes give or take a few making it a very easy watch as opposed to something like a seven hour (laughs) pay-per-view it was very easy to watch i watched it in one sitting with lots of replays because it was like it was that good but yeah well paced out the matches got longer as the night went which was great like every match was longer than the match before it it was paced out properly well done, well put together show. We have five matches on the card with three title matches and a number one contenders match. For the show, I was doing some prep work, and some of that included searching for Bret Hart quotes. And <laughs> let me tell you, it was like watching paint dry, man. When I say four out of ten, I meant four out of ten. Uh, we'll get into it when we get to the match, but watching him is like watching paint dry as well. <laughs> I got a note in here in my write-up for that match where he actually tried to smile. Did he? Oh, yeah. I don't have the timestamp, but damn it, I saw him try to smile. I saw a a quote when I was doing my research by some other person who also reviews. He said, Bret Hart looks like Natty tried to paint Bret Hart. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, that is so well put and correct. Talking about the spaces between the shows, Mm -hmm. uh, the next NXT special is TakeOver 2, and it's going to be on September 11th, 2014. Now, I am hoping, fingers crossed, that it doesn't take us that long to put Episode 3 out. (laughs) I mean, how long did it take Episode 6 to come out? 30 years? Star Wars reference here? So, we're good. As long as we beat 30 years, we're good. Side note. I pulled the car over for a second and reached bet in the back and slap you for a second. Mm-hmm. During the last episode, I kind of brought up how Triple H shoves himself into mania just to be able to say I was there. Even though it wasn't mania, what do you think about Triple H being in the uh, Japan Network special? I was fine with it. A little bit of dismay with the putting himself with the most popular dudes in Japan, the club, and then scoring the pinfall. But I really don't have a problem with it. I think... He respects the business enough to where, like, he wanted that Japan moment. You know, 30 years in the business, why not give him one? Or or seven, or eight, or more. I don't think he has that many Japanese moments. 
Look, I'm just saying that he's doing way better as a guy behind the scenes for NXT than yes. he is on the screen yeah. when he obviously has control over his own booking when he's on screen as well, too. I thoroughly enjoyed the fact that even in this one, because he, he was there for the uh, opener of the last event, but he wasn't in this one. They did mention a couple times that he was doing a Facebook Q&A afterwards, which I think is pretty cool. And it keeps him off the show, which I'm completely okay with, and I agree with not having your authority figure just on screen 24-7. I keep bringing this up, but this is almost akin to Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I don't know how much into Smoky Mountain you got into. I got into it pretty late myself, but that was another Jim Cornette venture. Yeah, I know he ran it. And although he ran it, he did a very good job of kind of separating the fact that he was actually running it behind the scenes. So he right. just looks like an announcer slash manager. Right. And I think if you take somebody off the street that is bought into the full kayfabe thing, mm-hmm. I don't think they would honestly think that Triple H was a real authority figure. I think they would much liken him to Jack Tunney. <laughs> you like your Jack Tunney, don't you? Funny Jack Tunney. <laughs> so after we go through all that hoopla, uh, we get ready for our first match, which is Adam Rose versus Camacho. It'll go 507. Decent opener, but uh, before the match even starts, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on because they cut to the outside of the arena. Right. Before you get full into that, uh, I did a little research, a little bit of background, mm-hmm. where these guys came from, why this match is taking place. Good call. Would you, would, you, would you like to hear some of this? Go on. I, I, I really do want to know about this because I got some fun facts afterwards. Yeah. So Camacho is real name Tonga Loa. Son of Haku. Yeah, I have here uh, Tavita followed by a bunch of letters. Somehow has a Vato gimmick. Not sure where it came from, but he did start off as an enforcer for Hunico. That name doesn't sound familiar to you, but he became one of your favorite wrestlers of all time, Sinbachi. Oh, God. Hunico famous for riding a bicycle to the ring for his entrance. You know, he got a bicycle. <laughs> he got a bicycle from what? somebody. Who would be riding a bicycle in this arena? I don't know. I didn't go too far in depth, but there was a couple of key moments in the wrestling buildup for Camacho. Apparently, he became friends with Hunico after he saved him from being jumped by a bunch of dudes, resulting in Hunico being stabbed, but not before he bit a man's eyeball out in the process. What? Exactly. Fun statement to say. He then later went on, started, they actually were on the main roster, mainly fighting for superstars and main event. Before coming back to NXT, after Hunico was injured, he fought Big E for a $5,000 bounty so that he could get Hunico out of Mexico. Another fun statement to say. They would continue to tag up until Hunico was called up to become, you know, the new Sin Cara when the old one left. Adam Rose, South African. Been wrestling since he was 15 years old. Started off with a gimmick known as Z-Max, which was a Karate Kid ripoff. His initially came to FCW and NXT. He wrestled under the name Leo Kruger, which was a tribute to his relative and former South African president, Paul Kruger. He broke his neck in 2010. What? Yeah, while wrestling in FCW. While he was recovering from that, he was a commentator for a while. Then he actually came back and was FCW champ for a little bit until March 6th when he became Adam Rose. This is kind of his debut on, you know, a special. The match itself came about because Camacho was a party pooper and attacked the Rosebuds because you should take wrestling serious and you shouldn't dance and party and have fun. Okay, so I have in my notes here the crowd chants something, but I can't quite make it out, and I think that's what it was. Yeah, they chanted party pooper at him a lot. They were chanting party time all the time. Kicking into the the intro, as you said, I noticed a couple famous Rosebuds. There was Becky Lynch, there was Ron Strowman, and there was Simon Gotch as his little conga line people. Oh, yeah. And we have my first Regal highlight of the night. Regal says, I was out partying with him last week, which is just funny. And then he says, I'm his number one strawberry. I've got a load of Regal quotes for the show tonight, my friend. (laughs) I'm his number one strawberry. What does that even mean? Out in the parking lot, Mm -hmm. and Adam Rose's Congo in line, his way into the arena. Now, I have noted that when this first happened, and they cut from the ring to the parking lot on the internal screens, Mm -hmm. you can kind of hear the air come out of the crowd like they knew something stupid was about to happen. But when they realized that it was... Adam Rose, who was coming in with his party line, they perked up, man. They The crowd is really behind this guy. They really are. I don't think it would work on a big scale, 
but in this small arena where everybody can kind of be involved and they can get in the chants and the dancing and all that, it, it did. It worked really well. The crowd was way into it. It was a good way to actually kick off the pay-per-view. So I do want to note that this is another Kevin Dunn production. And the reason I bring that up is it's because you have a crowd of about 400 people in there, right? Mm-hmm. And you could tell on the based on the camera views that if, if you're really looking, it's a small crowd. Yeah. But they shoot it like it's a full arena, like you were at a football stadium. If you didn't know any better, you would think that there's a couple of thousand people there. They know how to mic the crowd up because yeah. 400 people there sound better than 200 people at a TNA or a Ring of Honor show. Mm-hmm. Side note, I want to bash on Ring of Honor here for a second. Okay. Not necessarily the promotion, but their fans. Okay. Listen up, assholes. Some of you are going to listen to this show one day. One day, yeah. And I want you to know that there was a particular match that we saw that should have had your undivided attention. And I'm not going to go into this match because this will be another hour-long rant that I've already done off the air with Matt. You sons of bitches. Stop sitting on your hands. And when you see talent in front of you, you cheer them. Agreed. 100% agreed. This crowd is doing that. That's all I'm going to say about this because I don't want to get into what happened again. Because I want to say that last time... We went about an hour, and then I was in the parking lot throwing my pants around. <laughs> he was pantless. As Adam Rose get, makes his way into the arena, Lord Regal states that he wants to be a rosebud. He does. He does, and I, I love Lord Regal. I love the Blue Bloods in WCW. I want to see Lord Stephen Regal, the Blue Blood, be a rosebud. He sold this gimmick well. Like He really seemed to be – he was dancing. He really seemed to enjoy this character. And like I said, it was a great way to actually start off the pay-per-view. I have a note here somewhere talking about Regal. Is Stephen Regal lit right now? Do you mean in a drug sense, or is is there lights on him? No, I mean, like, has he been drinking? (laughs) Because he seems very energetic tonight. (laughs) I don't think so, because I do know he said at one point one of the other announcers made the call of, what's going through his mind? And he's like, I don't know, but I want some. (laughs) Um so no, I don't. I don't think so. I think he's just actually enjoying himself, and he knows he's going to see the good product. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, that is, I'm glad you brought that up because he is a critical asset to NXT. Very much, especially so. right now. Very much so. I know Dusty's in the back. Adam, baby, I need you to set up a party line. For the actual technical portion of this, I know that Steven Regal is a big trainer back there. Yeah. And it, it must be a sense of pride when you see somebody come on TV on one of your specials and know that they're getting a 10 out of 10 out of what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah, 100%. This is pretty much a proud father right here. Yeah. I actually didn't have a lot of notes for this match. Uh, I got some. Camacho enters and the crowd dies. Yeah, Mr. Brown Pants. Yeah, we kick off. Adam stalls with dancing around the ring like the... Red Rooster. I, I was actually a fan of this. It, it goes into what you were talking about, him actually doing 10 out of 10 on what he was supposed to do. He did, like, a little whip higgle to get out of a, a lock from behind. He was full uh, into character. Camacho puts Adam Rose into a full Nelson and then pushes yeah. him away because he used that whip higgle to get out of it. And Adam strangely jumps into Camacho to be carried like a baby. Yeah, it was great. The look on his face, his facial reactions were priceless, but Camacho was selling nothing, man. I was just going to say, the only note I have really on Camacho at this point in the match is the gimmick's terrible. All I could think of when I would see him was he looks like he should be paired up with the Usos. Like, he should just be their silent enforcer. He could be their big E of the Usos. I don't know. After eating somebody's eyeball out, he could be their Haku. Right? He's the son of Haku. Why don't you have him go out there and be a beast? It just makes no sense. Maybe he just has no charisma whatsoever because he definitely didn't show it in this match. So after the baby jump, Camacho gives Adam Rose an elbow and starts giving him the boots. It's followed up with a really good suplex from Camacho, but that'll be the fucking highlight of this match. Yeah. From from Camacho, I want to say. So yeah. Adam did a great job, but crowd is constantly cheering Adam. So much so that even when Rose puts on an Orton headlock, they are into it. Yeah, this crowd knows what they want, and it doesn't matter if it is, and we'll get a lot more into this on some of the other matches. Even if it's not necessarily getting what they want, they think they are, and they're going to be vocal about it. Adam Rose hulks up. He must have been watching some Hogan tapes because he was doing the the head shucking and arms throwing up, and he gets a big boot for his troubles. A good big boot. Uh, 
A really good big boot. We go into a second headlock, and uh, Regal starts using a thesaurus to do color. So, William Regal, let me ask you this. Now, at this point in the match, what does Adam Rose have to do to get things turned around? Survive. That's what Adam Rose has to do. He's in a very precarious predicament here. Beautifully applied to single arm. Straight jacket hold there by, by Camacho. The crowd starts chanting party time all the time. Now, you know with my bad hearing, it's hard mm -hmm. for me to distinguish some of these crowd chants. Yep. Uh, sometimes they just sound like, rrr, 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 rrr. this one I could clearly hear. Yeah, they were 100% loud and behind this character, this gimmick, this party lifestyle. My one critical note on Adam Rose because of this is he had this whole nonchalant, like, I, I'm not going to wrestle your way style of wrestling. I would have liked to have seen him, like, maybe after the big boot, start wrestling a little more seriously. Like, add that into the gimmick, you know? Like, oh, I really can wrestle. I just prefer to party. That would be really my only complaint with the character. You say that, and then right after the chants and the big boot and all that stuff, Adam Rose turns around and hits a good-looking spine buster. Which... That's what I'm saying. He shows that he knows how to wrestle. They should just highlight that a little more. Which Regal acknowledges came from the great Arn Anderson. Double A. He does, I, I, I'm assuming, I would probably call it the party train, because why wouldn't you? He does a Bronco Buster in the corner that he called Choo Choo for before he did it. Normally, I hate this move. You hate this move. Yeah. But he hit it once. He didn't sit there and try to jump up and down on him. It just became an offensive running maneuver. Well done. If you're going to do that move, that's how you do it. Hit it and get out. And then he followed that up with the party foul. Really good name for a finishing move, and a really good-looking finishing move. I don't know how to describe it 100%, but he had him in, like, a headlock on his shoulder and then DDT'd him into the mat. As soon as the match ends, the Rosebuds come out, right? And I got yeah. two notes for this. Mm -hmm. They give Adam a lollipop. Yes. You and I both know I've had some run-ins with the hospital, right? Yep. That lollipop looks like one of those morphine pops. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. I'm not trying to beat up on Adam Rose here because I know later on it, it comes out that he has a issue, but yeah. he's over it. So double thumbs up to him. Also note here that Regal is looking for Elvis. There's one missing. I'm looking for the one that I'm looking for. I was out with him all the other night. Cool. There's a one-legged Elvis impersonator. <laughs> does a wonderful rendition of Blue Suede Shoe. He's not there. Real quick, uh, because Camacho's not soon for this world. He's actually leaving right after this. Yep, final match. Yep, Camacho, real name Tavita, followed by a lot of letters, would leave NXT on June 12th after being released. He have a stint in TNA, claiming to be the son of Haku, which is the gimmick that he probably should have had here. Should have. Uh, not much to speak of on his run, and would leave TNA in 2016 and hit up some indies, followed by New Japan. And he's made a world of a difference in New Japan. He's one of those wrestlers that can't cut a promo without saying fuck. But he and his brother, they wrestle as the Gorillas of Destiny in New Japan. They're actually really good. Just no real charisma for my taste. So I got a side question for you. Mm -hmm. What do you think of wrestlers having lyrics to their themes? I'm going to give a bit of a cop-out answer, but I think it depends on the wrestler. And I have a perfect example of that coming up later tonight. I, just to go off of not people that are currently wrestling or on this card, Stone Cold didn't need lyrics. Perfect song. Oh, don't Where, worry, they would muddy that up when they did the Disturbed yeah, uh, it, it, version. <laughs> the greatest hit of Disturbed! Yes, terrible. Terrible choice. But it was good. The non-vocal version. Vince McMahon, awesome. Awesome theme song. The lyrics add to the swag. I, I think it 100% depends on the wrestler and how well they can get it over. I think it was Gangrel speaking on Stone Cold. He told him the tip for great theme music one time, and it was, you have to be able to walk to it. It sounds so basic, but if you can get your swag in from the entrance ramp to the ring, I don't care if it has lyrics or not, as long as it has that iconic feel to it for your character. I do think that sometimes... They can get a little too on the nose when they throw in lyrics, such as A Man Called Sting or Cactus Jack's theme song from WCW. But as long as you walk that fine line, I, I think it's okay. Randy Orton voices another good entrance theme with lyrics. So, yeah, it just depends on the wrestler. Personally, I think it's a little overused uh, because 
I know that in NXT, Jim Johnson is not doing the theme songs here. He's primarily getting ready for retirement at this point. Yeah, this is. I think most of the NXTs are CFO. So the Rosebud Party, Red Rooster strutting, and replays may have lasted longer than the actual match. It was a really quick match, and it was it wasn't bad. It did what it was supposed to do. It got Adam Rose over. All you needed was five minutes. So we cut to the booth, and we see Regal just with a big shit eating grin on his face. He is so happy to be there. He is loving life. And we throw to a promo package for El G- or Sami Zayn. We got a hype package highlighting the difference between oh him my and Tyler Perry. Goodness, this thing was awesome. This was probably the best buildup for Sami Zayn and Tyler Breeze <laughs> that they've had there in in their entire run with the Fed. Really good quote from Sami Zayn playing this underdog character. You know, I had to learn to lose to learn how to win. Oh, I got that in my notes right here, dude. Yeah, it seems like a just redundant thing to say, but it just it works for his character, and he sells it so well. Right after that promo package, we cut to Brandy Rhodes, baby. Brandy Rhodes. This was one of my highlights of the night. It's as simple as it seems, but Brandy Rhodes announcing Tyler Breeze has entered the building. Get out of my head, dude. I'm looking right at my notes, and we're over 5,000 miles apart. How awesome is that, though, for that heel ego character to have them announce whenever he enters the building? Phenomenal. Uh, we cut back into the ring, and we get ready for our next match, which is going to be the Ascension versus L. I, locale. Yeah, locale. I keep wanting to say local. Same. And, uh, <laughs> and Callisto. Yeah. Fun fact, the booth announces that the Ascension is at 239 days as tag champs. They are. This match will go 618, but before we get into the match, Give me some prehistory. So, a fun fact about the Ascension, it was initially a stable led by Ricardo Rodriguez. Does that name sound familiar to you? (laughs) Is he the fat one in the... uh, He is the the fat one. He is El Local. In FCW, where it started, he initially, uh, he had like a agent type gimmick, and he announced that he was going to be bringing this team of the Ascension in. Listen to this name. The, The names of their initial members... You might not know the names, but they all have some interesting quality about them. It was Ricardo Rodriguez, Raquel Diaz, who is the daughter of Eddie and Vicky Guerrero, Ooh. Kenneth Cameron, who is was at the time the husband of Charlotte Flair, Tito Colon, who would go on to be Epico and of Epico and Primo, and nephew of one Carlos Colon, mm. and then Connor who is actually still in the team and is the only remaining member of that team. He announced that they were coming out, and before they even showed up, Rodriguez was kicked out of the group. Tito was then called up to become Epico. Raquel went solo. Connor got injured, leaving only Cameron until Connor was to come back, at which point Cameron was arrested for For beating up his girlfriend, Mm. which was not Charlotte Flair, his wife. He was then released from the company. Good. And in November of 2012, left only Connor in the gimmick. And he would run around doing his own thing until about June, July of the next year, at which point Victor joined, and they would win the titles in October of that year. El Local, or El Local, Ricardo Rodriguez. He started as a backyard wrestler. It shows. Oh, God, yeah, it does in this. He then went on to do tons of indies. He first teamed with Del Rio in FCW and formed the Extension. But he was also, at this time, he was on SmackDown as Del Rio's ring announcer. But El Local was considered completely separate. Like, it wasn't, hey, this is Ricardo Rodriguez wanting to wrestle. It was two totally different gimmicks, two totally different characters. Why, though? I don't know. (laughs) He first started teaming up with another masked wrestler, Los Local Number 2, who was Tyson Kidd under a mask. They never won a match. That's a shame because, uh, well, we'll get into that later. We'll get into that. He was also a commentator for WWE's pay-per-views as part of the Spanish announce team. He's wearing a lot of hats at this point in time. Callisto, not a lot of notes. He did a lot of indies prior to coming to the Fed, at which point he almost quit due to injuries. He took a dive to the outside and landed on the concrete almost head first. Ooh. Yeah, was going to quit because he was suffering post-concussion syndrome which was causing a lot of depression and stuff. But he found out he was on WWE's radar. He was like, I, I got to keep trying. I got to keep trying. He then went on to AAA before finally 
debuting in May. He debuted like two weeks before this as Callisto. This match came about based on kind of a gimmick that was kind of being ran by the um, Ascension at the time. Okay. Which was they were just destroying jobbers left and right. So they started demanding competition because they had already beaten most of the actual tag teams at this point. So they started mix and matching random NXT stars to fight them, which they would also then destroy. And then finally, while this gimmick was going on for a while, El Local and Callisto would challenge them about two weeks prior to this actual event to the match that we're about to see. So the bell rings and the Ascension rush the Mexicans. Well, before even that, quick note, I prefer this look on the Ascension, man. They had the, the cut-up t-shirts. They weren't quite ripping off LOD or demolition at this point, you know, so no no shoulder pads, no real face paint. It was a good look for them. Oh, it was. Local, Local looks terrible. That's my first note of the match. He does look awful. I got some notes on him for later. Yeah. Right after we uh, rush the Mexicans, they are countered with her Karanas, and the Ascension roll outside to regroup. Leading to the, probably one of the spots of the match. Right. The Mexican team hits the other ropes. They are about to fly outside, and we have stereo uppercuts from the Perfect outside. Time. Couldn't have been better. It was at this point in the match I noticed for the show that Saxton was being sandbagged. Because mm-hmm. he would say something, and then there would be a couple of seconds of dead air from the announcers. Well, it's funny that you bring that up, because I just brought up my next note is actually how good Regal and Phillips were playing off of each other. Regal would talk about how the Ascension can't really hang their hats on anything great, because the quality of the people they've been fighting hasn't been great. And Phillips would respond with, yeah, that's because the other tag teams are actually scared to fight them. We're having to scrape up whoever we can get to get out there. So they're throwing in this really nice back and forth. Talking about pretty much that gimmick, like I was talking about, as well as the fact that this is supposed to be a challenge for them. This is the first team to step up that wasn't afraid to take on the Ascension. Right after that, I also have another note here. It says, uh, Ricardo must suck an egg. He doesn't even work with the crowd on the outside of the ring. A really good note here, too. A comment by William Regal. He says, uh, most tag teams do well by keeping the opposing team in their half of the ring. Ascension does it better because they keep them in their quarter of the ring. That is true because Callisto about had a tent set up in that corner. Yeah, he did. Really good teamwork by the Ascension. Callisto is a boss level seller though. He oh, yeah, sold he his ass. He sold like death. Connor choke slams Callisto from the outside to the That's second exactly row. What I was about to go into. Bounces him off of it, but when Connor goes for it again, Callisto counters it. They basically just hurry up and get back to the inside. And but holy crap, was that spot good? Oh yeah. And then as soon as they get back to the inside, Connor knows that he needs to kind of change things up, so he tags in Victor, who turns around and hits him with a two by four. No, it wasn't really yeah. a two by four, but that chop could have been heard from three zip codes over. That chop was phenomenal. So guess what? It's time for El Locale to finally get in the ring. And he does a moonsault that is slightly better than Terry Funk. Oh, but you weren't going to speak on the Hurricane Rana before that. That was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to ignore some of what he did. My next note is actually just El Locale sucks. He sucks so bad I had to write it twice in my notes. Yeah, so after we figure out that uh, that's pretty bad, the Ascension hits the fall of man and gets the three and do their pose over Ricardo. And I have a question at this point. Mm -hmm. Is the crowd chanting yaw? I couldn't figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea what's going on here, but I think we made that note last pay-per-view as well. The Howard Dean scream? It brought it up again, and I still don't know why they're doing this. This leads me to the actual question I had for you. Was this bad booking or great booking? It's going to be a little bit of both because after this show, Mm -hmm. not soon after, Rodriguez would be released around the same time as Camacho. But, I mean, mean in in the efforts of... He, he obviously sucks. Callisto's great. You could have had Locale get his ass kicked the whole time. But is did they cover the fact that Locale was just so bad that they had Callisto work the whole match? But I thought Therefore, the booking was backward. Book. Agreed. But that's so, what I mean, though. Does it actually become good booking when you find out how bad Locale actually is to where you even though Callisto's not going to get over from this, he's still not going to be stuck with a terrible partner for the whole time? No, I see where you're going with that. It's just that you had three months between the last show and now. You could have put a better tag team than this. Anybody. Anybody. And if you know, because you know when you're going to release somebody. If you know he's going to be released, could you just had him go in and do the favors? And yeah. I mean, granted, he took the pin fall. He took so, the pin. Eh, eh. But yeah, that's what I was going to say earlier. Callisto is the highlight of this match, despite being on the losing team. 
He actually worked great, sold awesomely. So he does still come out a little strong, but yeah, just give him any other partner. After this, you know, obviously he gets released about the same time as Camacho. Mm-hmm. He's going to hit the Indies for a little bit, and eventually, in late 2014, uh, actually this year that we're in, he's going to wind up in AAA, and he's going to resume his entrance announcing for the now El Patron. Now currently works for Combates de Artes, El Patron's wrestling slash MMA venture. The good old Jeff Jarrett booking. So he's keeping Ricardo with him as much as he can. So after the match, we throw to a Sammy Zayn and Tyler Breeze backstage segment. I really like this segment. Yeah, now I, I want to make a quick point here. Oh, crap, I forgot something. Kind of carry off of what you said. Regal is talking about how the Ascension needs some good competitors for this match. Yes. So, I mean, he's really building them up to be basically the doomsday of the tag team division. As, and as they were. So I'm going to admit that at first Tyler Breeze had X-Pac heat with me. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, the gimmick finally grew on me because, to me, he's a modern-day Rick Martel. Very much so. And I think it works for him because sooner or later he will get his selfie stick. Yep. I said uh, I like the contrast in the initial shoot back. You have Sammy prepping in a dark locker room, trying to get ready like a wrestler would. And then you just have Tyler Breeze staring at himself in a mirror while filming himself with a camera. (laughs) Great. We have the actual Tyler Breeze promo package. Okay. Um, Hyping him up a little bit. Uh, Also notable, a wild Alexa Bliss appears. Uh, I noticed that, but she didn't have all of her stupid clown makeup on. No. Great line by Tyler Breeze in this. He asks her if she wants to take a picture. She says yes, goes in to take a picture with him, and he goes, no. Do you want to take a picture of me? That, That was good. So into character. Yes, I am a model. Yeah, it's so awesome. We're getting ready for the Tyler Breeze and Sami Zayn match. Hit me with your knowledge stick. Tyler Breeze. Okay. He started off in Canada. He didn't do much indies. But while he was doing the indies, he was trained by one of my all-time favorite wrestlers of all time, Lance Storm. Ooh. How? He has way too much personality. I know, right? Where did it come (laughs) from? He then was signed to FCW and NXT. He went by multiple ring names prior to this, prior to 2013 where he finally debuted as Tyler Breeze and started this pretty boy model gimmick. Would you like to guess who gave him the idea of carrying the iPhone around and filming himself? Mm, Flair? Triple H. You got to give the man some credit, man. He's, he's got a good mind behind the scenes. But that's pretty much it. He, he, didn't, he hasn't done a whole lot prior to this. For Sami Zayn notes, you can definitely check out our last episodes, so we won't add too much here, but the contrast between the two characters here as well as prior to coming to NXT, he was El Generico, and he wrestled everywhere. So Tyler Breeze is still a novice pretty much, whereas Sami Zayn has been doing this all over the place. And he's pretty much been in the main event picture of NXT since he's debuted with NXT. That's awesome. Yeah. This match came about after our last show when Woods and Breeze were destroyed by Rusev instead of having their match. Um, He feuded with, with Woods for a while after that before participating in a 20-man battle royale on May 8th, so just a few weeks before this, the winner of this battle royal was going to be the number one contender. And it actually came down to a three-way tie. All three men hit the ground at the same time. And you really need to go back and watch this spot. It's actually super well done. I think Breeze actually did hit last, but when you watch it at full speed, they all three hit the ground at the same time. And the other two people that were part of the three were Sami Zayn and Tyson Kidd. On May 15th, the three of them had a triple threat match for the number one contendership, which Tyson Kidd won, which is why he's in the main event, and left the other two to have this match set up by JBL for the new number one contender. Really good booking. Sami Zayn comes out to the first big pop of the night. I'm talking big pop of the night. I, I have a note on that real quick. His, he has, apparently this is new theme music for him that starts out with the oh, 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 oh. The fans totally ignore the O's and instead chant Ole at him. So I'm told, because I had somebody else listen to this where I'm at right now, mm-hmm. that's a soccer thing? Yes. But okay. it, was, it was part of his... El Generico gimmick, the Ole Ole Ole. It was his theme song that he used. Obviously, the WWE is trying to get them to chant oh, 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 oh. Instead, the fans are having none of that. So Tyler Breeze comes out, and I see a sign in the crowd that says, Breeze is my dad. Nice. He did really good on his walkout. He would walk a couple steps and then stop and look at the camera. And then walk a couple steps and then stop and look at the camera. I do want to make a note. Earlier, we talked about uh, lyrics and theme songs. 
Mm -hmm. It works here. Yes. Because he's singing, singing his, his own, own theme, theme song. song. Yeah. Even the announcers pointed out he's also got a new theme song for this show. I had a note that Regal is talking about him, talking about like what his clothes and tights are made out of and everything. Legit sounds smitten. There's no other word for it. He is in love with this man. We kick off. Bell rings. Start with a few reversal arm locks. Yep. So a couple of good arm drags, and then we go back to the arm locks. I had the note that it starts off really slow, which led me to a question to ask you at this point. What do you think of Breeze's tights? Should a character like this actually be wearing, for the most part, traditional wrestling tights? This always bothered me with Rick Martel, as we mentioned earlier. If you have this pretty boy gimmicky, shouldn't you have something different to set you, set you aside from the other just typical wrestlers? I'm with you to a point. Mm -hmm. Yes and no, and I was okay with what he had in the ring for his ring gear because he came out in something horrendous-looking fur thing. Right. When you're in the ring, don't want gear that takes away too much from the actual match that's going on. Fair enough. Also, it could cause a problem as far as interference in the actual match itself. For somebody like Breeze and Rick Martel, they make it a point throughout the match to add to the psychology of don't mess with my face, don't mess with my hair. Right. You know, that's kind of my, it, it's my money maker. You don't want to mess that up because that's my, that's who I am. Right. So I think as long as you have somebody that can actually know how to put some ring psychology into it for their character, you can take away from the flashiness of the ring gear because it's, tra it, it, it's a trade-off. The more ring gear you have, L locale, the more it takes away from the fact that you may or may not be good. Yeah, but was L locale bad because of his gear, or did he make that gear look bad? <laughs> it's a little bit of both for him. Yeah. One of these things don't look like the other. One of these things is fat. He's fat! <laughs> Very. <laughs> All right, sorry. Go ahead now. <laughs> So Sami Zayn throws Breeze into the corner and then fakes rakes him to a pop. Mm -hmm. And the fans are behind the fact that this guy loves himself too much. Mess up his face. They are so into this match. Breeze counters a second rope boot and dumps Sammy to the outside. Yes. And I have another comment here about Saxton. I think he's on a word limit. <laughs> well, I was going to touch on that, the, the dump to the outside. Because even prior to this, he broke up, um, I think it was a headlock from Sami Zayn by mm -hmm. grabbing and raking the nose of Sami Zayn. And then he does this where he pushes him out to the outside and is willing to take a count out victory off of it. He has a very, it's a very smart character gimmick of, yeah, I'm pretty, but I don't have to work that hard if I can. So he's not cheating out of malice. He's just he's wrestling smart and he, yeah. really good little things throughout this match that he keep, continues to do to add into that character. So Sammy jumps and bounces off the top rope from the outside to hit Tyler Breeze outside the ring, which was really smooth. And it was followed up by a top rope crossbody for a two count. So smooth, so smooth, but a little bit close to the actual ramp for my liking. It looked like Breeze banged his head a little bit on the ramp, but it still looked great. Sami Zayn grabs Tyler Breeze's trunks as he tries to run the ropes, but it, no, 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 and converts it to a blue thunder bomb for a two count. That was slick. So good. I, I have a note at this point that Sammy wrestles, Breeze does moves. Yeah. Because Sammy is smooth, and every move he does is setting something else up, whereas Breeze kind of goes from move to move. And that goes into what I was talking about earlier. You can see the, the difference in experience between the two they still mesh together fairly well there's a couple clunky spots throughout the match that they cover up very well keeping them from being actual botches Tyler Breeze pulls Sami Zayn out of the corner to a powerbomb type move he grabs him by the legs and yanks him out yeah I have that corner powerbomb so awesome by Breeze yeah hits a two count he, he released him and like Generico went another foot above his head before he grabbed him back down for the powerbomb it looked phenomenal on both of their parts yeah, Sami Zayn hits an exploder suplex in the corner to chance of this is awesome. Mm -hmm. We're quickly followed up by the boo, yeah, punch trade in the mm -hmm. center of the ring. And we have a great suplex kicks by Breeze for a two count. I have at this time a note that the crowd and the announcers are watching a different match than I am. And I'm, I'm not, almost there with you. I'm not trying to be negative, but they're selling this like it's the best match ever. And the announcers keep talking about how hard hitting it is, how just they're going to war. But there's a lot of dead space in it. Like, yeah, I, I this no way want to shit on the match. It was really good, but not to the level that the announcers and the crowd are making it seem. 
Yeah, the match goes 1555. And I'm going to say for the first half of the match, the ring general here is Sami Zayn. Clearly. He knows that old adage of if you think you're going too slow, slow down. Yeah. And it, it's perfect for this match. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he's yeah. doing it correctly. Yeah. I still think it's a great match. It's just not quite what everybody's making it out to be. Dude, there are so many counters in this match that you would think that you're in an Ikea. Tyler Breeze punches a couple of times to Sami Zayn while he's in the ropes, and Sami Zayn slaps the ever-loving shit out of him. What is the five fingers say to the face? <laughs> what? Slap! <laughs> yeah, he did. Weird powerbomb reversal to a roll-up. To a powerbomb. I, I have a note on this. This is one of those wonky spots I was talking about. Yeah. They saved it well. They didn't try to go back and redid what they messed up. They just went to the next step of the move. Yeah, they did really well. Like I said, it, I think a lot of people that would watch it would probably call it a botch. I wouldn't. I think that I think they saved it. They moved to the next part. And it went well. Talabreeze dumps to the outside, and Sami Zayn flies out on top of him. Talabreeze will then duck a boot to the face in the corner. The hell of a kick. Yeah, and hits the beauty shock for the win. Right, but you're missing the beauty of this finish. He ducked the halluva kick, but went to block his face so he wouldn't get kicked in the face, causing his elbow to actually crotch Sami Zayn. Oh, Leading yeah, to, so yeah, the ref so was the ref a little confused about this. Like, did you just hit him? Did you just low blow him? And he's like, no, nah, man, I was blocking my face. So you have this good ending to where Sami Zayn doesn't look weak. It was just a weird man. He accidentally hit him in the balls. Neither person leaves this match actually looking weak. They both look strong. Tyler Breeze for hitting the beauty shot, which is a terrible name for a move. But the kick was really good. He got some really good height on it. He looks strong because he wins the match. And Sami Zayn doesn't look terrible because he lost the match on a fluke. I have this exact note. I think that only Sami, he's the only one that could look stronger in defeat here. Yeah. And as we saw with Cesaro last pay-per-view, he looks so good when he wrestles that it doesn't really matter if he wins or loses. Yeah, this match was well-paced and very technical. Although kind of slow compared to the other matches we've seen these two guys in, the crowd loved it because of the story. Yeah. And they chose the right winner here because the winner of this is going to go on to face either Tyson Kidd or Adrian Neville, who both kind of have that same gimmick as Sami Zayn, I know how to wrestle. So you have, again, this beautiful wrestling comes second person versus somebody who knows how to wrestle. So you can continue this story with another person. Smart booking. So we throw to backstage, and Brett is in the back with Natty and Tyson Kidd sharing his bitterness. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, this is a head-scratcher. Lana. Yeah. They come out speaking some communism, and then they go, I want to say they go for like two or three minutes just agging on the crowd, and then, holy shit, it's Pray for Mojo. Well, at the beginning of this, I have Rusev proves here less is more. He says I, he only says two sentences, like Rusev, whatever, Rusev crush. All right. he needs to say. And then pray for Mojo. I have here written, oh, shit, it's pray for Mojo Duggan. It is. I have three questions. Mm -hmm. One, why did Mojo have a flag backstage? Two, what the hell is up with his voice he's using? And three, why is there a stand for the flag that he was just weirdly holding backstage? I... I don't know. I'm going to go over the few notes I have for this real quick, okay? Go for it. So Mojo Duggan rushes the ring and gets squashed by Rusev. I mean... Quickly. Yeah, quickly. I have a note here from Regal who is very glad he's British. He says, how embarrassing for Americans, and I personally <laughs> could not agree more. He's, he says he's also happy to have a red shirt on, so he's good. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm... I... Uh... I don't, I, I don't understand this, this spot. I don't either, because he, then he gets dumped outside the ring. Mm -hmm. And then I guess hype isn't enough. He really needs your prayers. And maybe this is where Pray for Mojo started? I hope so. What was this segment, dude? I have nothing much written down. <laughs> I mean, it, don't get me wrong. It put Rusev over good. But why? Because he's not in NXT. He's on the main roster. Exactly. Why? I, 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 head scratcher. The only part of the night to where I really am just like, I don't understand what's going on. I, I I would say maybe it's because some match went short or something like that. But no, the card was only billed for five matches, and they went and, perfect. And I would say that some of the matches were even a little long. Yeah, I think this one coming up is going to kick that off. So we cut backstage. I already said we cut backstage to Brett showing the bitterness. Nope, this is a different part. 
Oh, okay. So the hype package. And then we come back to the hype package for Charlotte and Natty. And hit me with your knowledge stick. Before we get into that, let's go over some of the bits in this hype package real quick. Okay. First and foremost, I have to say, 2014 Charlotte is the best looking Charlotte. I have a clip just for you, my friend. Do you? I was so nervous. I wasn't confident in myself. I wasn't even confident in my gear. I wasn't confident with the overall idea that I was wrestling. And it shows. It's Charlotte from last year talking about when she first got in NXT. Okay, cool. Yeah, Charlotte looks nice here. Yeah, it did make me laugh. There's a note. She says, I'm genetically superior. Then why do you keep changing yourself? Uh, Amen, brother. You don't need the plastic. You are a beautiful woman. Quit it. Were, were. Yeah. Another highlight of the, the package. Natty goes, yeah, well, she thinks her dad's the best, but my uncle's the best. And I'm like, oh, man, what about Jim? Uh, what about Jim? What about your dad? And this is before he passed, too. Yeah. And then the really good line by Flair to end the package, they're going to have to open up a Flair wing of the Hall of Fame. So you have a real build of Charlotte's trying to do this on her own, and it still seems like Natty's trying to live off of Brett. And eh, I don't know how I feel about that. Poor Natty. She's not really NXT right now. The Fed is trying everything with her, so they even brought in Brett to kind of scowl away yeah. people from her. She has a very checkered past with WWE. Basically, yeah. right now, uh, she's in the right place at the wrong time. Agreed. She was a women's wrestler and not a diva when, at the time, they were going with divas. Yep. And right now, you're trying to take somebody who's been branded a diva because she was there during that time into women's wrestling. Mm-hmm. She's back and forth between the main rosters and NXT, and she's basically – she's a carpenter right now. She's filling up the job slots that need to be filled up. There's no consistent story. There's no consistent build. She's just there. It's like somebody else we'll go into later. <laughs> I know. I will say this for the match, though, but this was by far probably the best use of Legends I have ever seen in a match. Agreed, and we'll definitely get in that in a moment right after I hit you with this knowledge. Okay. So, Charlotte, daughter of Rick, if you had to guess the person to first train Charlotte Flair, what name would you choose? I'm not going to go with Rick because I've heard in interviews and from him and others that he is an awful teacher. It was not Rick. It was Lodi. Do you remember Lodi? I know that name. Was that part of the flock? He carried the signs for the flock. Oh, my God. <laughs> was the first trainer for Charlotte. Just weird, random information there. She really didn't do much before coming into uh, NXT, honestly. She joined NXT. She formed a stable with Sasha and Summer Rae called the BFFs, the Beautiful Fierce Females. And they stayed together until, and this is also a weird sentence to say, Summer Rae got called up. Summer Rae got called up before Charlotte and Sasha. Uh. She's still been kicking it around with Sasha. That's pretty much it until the tournament. Natty, daughter of Jim. Her fun fact, she started off in late 2000-2001 as a host and ring announcer for the Eric Bischoff-led promotion, Matt Rats. Have uh, you ever heard of it? No. It was a youth promotion in Canada for 14 to 21-year-olds. Ring announcers were Joey Styles and Don Callis. That seems like an actually good combo. Yeah. And the only reason the company didn't take off was child labor laws. In this, in this company, you could only wrestle if you were between the ages of 14 to 21. So no advertisers wanted to touch it. They couldn't get funding because child labor laws. What year was this? 2000 to 2001. Uh, mm. And it's where a lot of the Canadians started off. Davey Boy Jr., Tyson Kidd, Teddy Hart, Natty. One of the guys we saw in the AEW show, uh, Jack Evans. Okay. So that they had talent, they had a good backer, they had good announcers. It was just nobody wanted to deal with the fact that it's kids wrestling. She then went on to do the basic Canada run, you know, that everybody does if you're from Canada. She then moved to Deep South, OVW, and then up to the main roster until coming back down to NXT. As you said, they just kind of threw her around a lot. Um, there was a tournament to decide the new champion because Paige was called up and therefore forced to relinquish the belt. And that's pretty much the buildup for this. All right. So before we kick off, while Charlotte and Natty are on their way to the ring. Oh, wait, wait. Before we even get into that. Okay. So the hype package ends, 
and out comes Paige. Paige here. We noticed on the last show of NXT Arrival, NXT and WWE are really good about kind of placing celebrities throughout the crowd. Oh, yes, I have this note. And tonight, our special guest for this match is Chris Christopherson. I'm probably saying that all wrong because I've always said his name wrong. Chris Christopherson. I, yeah, I, dude, I love this guy. I have all his records. Cover starting the game. Now, Fever, you were trucking with a rubber duck, and I'm about to pull a plug on your drink. I have all his movies. You probably have no idea who this guy is. No. Here's what I found funny about this. They announce him as Chris Christopherson, the star of the Blade trilogy. I know when they said that. And I, I'm like, I, that's the motherfucking rubber ducky, man. I know. Convoy. What happened to the convoy? <laughs> I know. I was like, what are you doing? Blade trilogy. Oh, I actually my God. got that exact note, man. Rubber ducky is in the house. I couldn't believe it, man. When they said that, I about threw my laptop across the hall. 100% agree. And then we have Paige here. Looking great. Uh, Matt, Paige comes out. What'd she say? Uh, she basically, she just put over the crowd. She put over NXT. She put over the title. It was probably her best actual promo. Um, she said, you guys made me. You guys made me a champion. You guys made it to where I was able to go on the main roster and be a champion. Now give these girls a chance to do the same thing. Simple, to the point. It worked well. She looked great. She's another one. Quit with the plastic surgery. Charlotte comes out with the nature boy. How good is this theme song? Oh, it is. And I, I look, I got to give Rick credit here. He has been itching to help one of his kids make it. Yep. And this man who has wrestled for all these years has finally found a role right now. It's probably one of the best managers in the business. So good. I, I have a note that Charlotte comes out and she does her little snap and then she makes Rick do the snap too. And Rick's just loving it. Whatever it takes to get his daughter over instead of him. Uh, we talked in between shows that we feared that with Rick coming in as a manager, that Rick might turn into Rick. Yeah, but no, he's totally Team Charlotte all the way. I'm going to say this, and this will be the last time I say it. We're going to run into the part of our storyline where the four horsewomen show up. Mm -hmm. Flair should have been the J.J. Dillon. Agreed. I doubt it'll be the last time you say it. They should have pulled the trigger on this. As Rick comes out, Regal... <laughs> Once again, his liver's shaking in his body. <laughs> and then we cut inside, uh, seeing Charlotte get into the ring, and oh my God, it's Lil Nate. Lil Nate. How appropriate. So good. And then the music hits, and Natty comes out, and Brett frowns at everyone. Natalia's theme, also good. It has that remix of the whole Heart Foundation, Bret Hart vibe to it as well. Here's where I have another note. Like I said, Rick did the snap that Charlotte does and made it all about Charlotte. Brett... Gave Natty a high five. <laughs> Damn it, Brett. <laughs> Make it about her, man. <laughs> hey, in all fairness, he tried. <laughs> right? That is probably um, the most enthusiasm we've ever seen out of him for the last 10 years or so. Was it? I want to go back to when I was a little kid. I remember going to the wrestling matches for the very first time. And I'd be riding in the car down to the wrestling matches with my brother's and it was like right from the very start, I remember I'd be riding in the car and my dad would pull up to the hotel and uh, I remember when I was real young, they picked up the midgets. And uh, I remember I thought, oh, cool, you know, I got, finally got some wrestlers that I can play around with, you know. Um, I love that they announced that Charlotte is from the Queen City. It's just a nice <laughs> touch. It is. We get a traditional NWA Ric Flair collar and elbow lockup to start off. Yeah. Followed by traditional mat wrestling with reversals. I had one problem at this point. They kept cutting to Rick and Brett, and like you missed a couple of the reversals because of this. I think that's fine because the reversals that they were doing were reverse arm locks. Yeah. Still, it's kind of a big point in this early stage of the matches. Cut to them when there's dead stuff going on. Lord Regal saves it. I'm with you because I thought that the camera should have been in the ring. Mm-hmm. They ha the ca you know the camera guys had to get their spots in for showing that Flair and Bret Hart were out there. Lord Regal recovers this by putting out a fantastic line about how this is a chess game. The origins of, of our industry. This is truly going to be a chess game, a human chess game. Nobody wants to make that first move 
that, that's going to throw off their game. Nobody wants to get caught with a, a quick submission or a quick fall, a quick roll-up. Yeah. I have that even early on in this match, these are the best two wrestlers of the night. Just even in the first open in salvo. They're so smooth. Every move leads to another move. They're even wrestling with their legs to do reversals and stuff. It's just beautiful, actual wrestling. We have a failed power bomb into a roll-up, quickly kicked out of, into a crossbody scissors. Yes. Charlotte slaps Natty, and Natty returns one as well. I have a note on the slap. Mm -hmm. Charlotte chops Natty. Rick taunts Natty. Regal says, this is probably my actual favorite quote of Regal of the night. That's not just a chop. It's a whack to the sternum. <laughs> Love that I, technical I, calling. You basically just read my next line. <laughs> Almost verbatim. During that, holy crap, Brett actually cracked a smile at that sequence. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Charlotte hits a backpack stunner to get out of another crossbody scissors. Yep. Pins uh, And you hear Rick yell from the outside, you got to count. He's so into this match. <laughs> Charlotte puts Natty in the corner with a boot and then drags her out to the middle of the ring, puts her in a head figure four. Yes. And rolls over and beats her head in the mat with a couple of hip thrusts. Beautiful. Natty reverses an abdominal stretch into an abdominal stretch on Charlotte. Yep. Then she st uh, Natty starts running the ropes and walks on Charlotte, bounces off the other rope into a drop kick. Didn't walk on her, stomped her into the ground. Natty dumps Charlotte to the outside, and Charlotte pulls her off the apron onto the outside. But Charlotte misses with a beautiful moonsault when they get back into the ring. I have a note on this. They did this spot so perfect. Charlotte never looked at Natty. She just did this blind mood salt, and Natty moved at the perfect time to be completely out of the way. It was everything about this was timed perfectly, and so much trust between the two of them. Because like I said Charlotte never looked to even see if Natty was back there. Just moon salt, and poof, she vanished. It was great. This is also where we get our first. This is awesome chance, and well deserved. I, they're completely deserved. This match is awesome. I notice on the outside that on every two count, Brett is actually selling every kick out. He is. He's doing good on this. Not quite. I mean, I think he's a little overshadowed because, like I said, Ric Flair is yelling at the refs. Rick's doing – like, Rick is into this match for Charlotte's sake. Brett's just kind of there. So, Natty puts on a sharpshooter. The weakest-looking sharpshooter I've ever seen. Charlotte counters and puts on a figure four. She does. Natty rolls it over, and both roll, roll for freedom. But then they both forget, as well as the announcers, how a figure four works. I know. I was a little confused on what was going on. <laughs> I have no idea. Natty was selling nothing. The announcers say that she reversed the pressure, even though it's still exactly the same move that was on. I have no idea what's going on. Charlotte rolls outside, and Little Nate breaks it up. This hanging figure four that she had on, though, before Little Nate breaks it up, Right. Be beautiful. Like, I'm going to say that a lot for the stuff in this match, but it was beautiful. Charlotte kicks Natty straight in the asshole. <laughs> into the steps. Booting ass. <laughs> so they both get back inside, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where I lost it. Natty looks over at Flair and has the worst woo in existence. It So woo. bad. Woo. <laughs> I'm a cow. Woo. <laughs> I do want to make a note that Flair, right after this awful woo, gets up on the apron, leans in between the ropes, and is trying to, I don't know, distract, cacaw, I, I, I don't know. Cacaw, motherfucker, cacaw. <laughs> he is in this, and yeah, is. Lil Nate just having none of it. So then we have Charlotte, who makes direct eye contact with Brett and taunts him before locking in a sharpshooter of her own. Before we get to the final of the match, Charlotte hits the down to the queen and gets the three. Yeah, it's a terrible name for this move. It's a good looking move. It's a little on the knees cutter. It looks good, but it's not a great name for it. As the pin happens, Rick goes crazy. Flair loses his shit outside the ring and then joins Charlotte in the ring. So Flair goes crazy, starts spinning his jacket around. Then we have the respect is shown. Flair cries. And then they go to leave. Rick refuses to allow Charlotte to open the ropes for him and instead opens the ropes for her. 
and then we get a shot of little Nate carrying Rick's jacket. Oh, <laughs> which probably went straight to his house. <laughs> yeah. It was a good, good little ending. I don't know how I feel about the respect being shown. Charlotte's supposed to be ultimate hill at this time, but you know, whatever. It worked well. Like I said, Rick's crying, selling for Charlotte like a boss. Um, totally putting her over. They're even going out on the ramp, and like he's walking like five steps behind her. And Charlotte's like, no, get over here, hug me. And like forces him back into the spotlight and stuff. He is so good in this role of not wanting to be in a role and allowing Charlotte to get all of the accolades she deserves. It's good to see Flair just be so proud of his daughter. Yeah, so happy. I mean, it crosses that line of storyline and kayfabe into this man is really a proud father at this point. Yeah. And I'm I'm really happy for Rick. I also have the next note is, once again, the championship match is screwed. Because this was a hell of a match. By far, probably the match of the night. Yeah, so we leave from there, and we go straight into a Neville and Tyson Kidd package. It was all right package. It was, but I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. So you know how Vince and Kevin Dunn hate Southern accents, right? Hate Southern. Are they so bent on that that when Neville speaks that they ignore it? So I took action. Perhaps I was a little bit ruthless, but I obliterated an entire division to remind everybody just how good I am. I have no idea what Neville said. If there were such a thing as British rednecks, it'd be Neville. Neville, definite, definite Boomhauer. I'm having a hard time understanding him. I get the point that he's trying to make. Yeah. Good Lord. <laughs> so before we kick off the match, uh, we cut to Cesaro and Christian in the crowd. Good placement. Good, good people, good, right people for a championship match. Did you notice who was behind him? I did not. It's the Bailey hug kid. Was it? Mm-hmm. I didn't notice her in the last episode. I might uh-huh. have to go back and scan the crowd again. I think it was overshadowed by all the Pray for Mojo family shirts. Mojo. For me, this is her first official appearance, so I'm guessing she's a resident there with her family. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. In the ring, old school NWA introductions. Brandy Rhodes is in the ring and properly introduces I have a note on the that. competitors. Like, it's a little thing, but she's really good at announcing. She I is. And thought she did good. One note here, since the last episode... AEW has officially started up. Yeah. What do you think of the weigh-ins? I prefer weigh-ins, uh, especially for your big shows. Yeah, it's fake, whatever you want to say. But the weigh-ins add that bit of spectacle. It adds that bit of legitimacy to what you're doing. So adds, I, I, I'm a fan. It adds that bit of kayfabe. Mm-hmm. All right, Matt, hit me with your knowledge stick. For Adrian Neville, see last episode. For Tyson Kidd, he is the final graduate of the Heart Dungeon. Started wrestling at the age of 15, did the Basic Canada run, as we said. One fact that makes him different than the other Basic Canada runs, at the age of 25, he was made the co-booker of Stampede Wrestling. Ooh. And was also heavily involved in training all of their wrestlers. He did this for a year, then he went to New Japan for a run, then down to Deep South, to Florida Championship Wrestling, to NXT to the main roster with the rest of the Hart Foundation. He's been back in NXT since December, and from what I see, he is on a bit of a winning streak. He's been on a winning streak since coming back from injury, which ties into the buildup for this match, which is Neville wants to win to show that he's great, but Tyson wants to win to move on to bigger and better things, to go back to what he was doing prior. You know, he's had his WrestleMania moment. He wants to go back to Raw. He wants to go back to SmackDown. He wants to go back to WrestleMania. And he's going to use Neville as a stepping stone to do this. And Neville takes full offense at this, as he should, but it's a good build between the two. I have a note for their entrances. Generic themes are generic. Yeah, but it's covered up by the fact that Regal hits us with some extraordinary commentary for these guys. But before we even get to that, they have a a note from last last pay-per-view's main event. Todd Phillips says that ladder match was called the biggest match in NXT history. Not called the best, not called great, but called the biggest match in NXT history. I think we can agree with that. It wasn't as great last show. (laughs) We get a nice humble brag by Regal where he says that he talks about the two of these people coming from foreign countries where they had to get over in their country and then come to America. 
and do it all over again, which is something he had to do as well. Get um, out of my head, dude. I got that exact line right here. Right? It was such a good line. But he did put them over even more because he said they're doing it at a level I couldn't even have done. But they're not at this point. They're still not regal at this point. We kick off with a, another traditional collar elbow lockup that goes into the corner. So we get some reversal mat wrestling following up. Tyson pats Neville on the head after the exchange. He did. He patted him on the head and I think smacked him on the back. And the fans start chanting, you got served. How very he nice starts, of you. He starts to go a little bit hill at this point. Neville hits an arm drag into arm bar number 38. Which the fans notice and start chanting, arm bar, arm bar, arm bar. Oh, because the arm bar got overused on this one. Yeah, they. you could tell this crowd wanted so much more from this match. Uh, you had it in the hype package. You have two wrestlers that know how to wrestle. They show they know how to wrestle in this match. But there's just so, it's so slow. And they keep teasing like they're going to kick it to the next level. And they just never do. They, there were a couple of moments where it got in about third or fourth gear. But then they slowly down geared to go back to. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They, they would tease it and then just go right back to just boring. Uh, Neville hits a suplex into armbar number 47. Mm-hmm. Tyson tries for a code breaker. Now, this was cool, but Neville flips out of it. But it's followed up with an arm drag and <laughs> because both of them hit the ground, and they do a stereo kip up. Well done. We got a little bit of jaw jacking, and Tyson hits Neville down. I mean, I don't think it was a slap. I think it was just straight up punch. Yeah, just knocked him down. Puts Neville in the tree of woe, followed by lifted kicks to the back. And then he goes to the other corner and then runs and does a double drop kick to the head. Now, you know my hatred of the tree of woe. I do. I think it was actually used right here. I think it usually is. Mm. <laughs> Tyson Kidd holds a Randy Orton headlock and demands that the ref check Neville out to see if he's either out or gives up. Yep. Neville breaks free, but Tyson lifts and drops Neville on the top rope. Tyson drop kicks Neville outside, which was... I, that was a nasty spot. Yeah, I, I couldn't quite figure out what was going on here. I wouldn't have taken it. But Tyson Kidd follows up with running through the middle ropes onto Neville on the outside. We get back in the ring. We have a failed two count, and Tyson goes for another headlock and tosses Neville in the corner. Neville counters with a boot to the face. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so they start trying to do what looks like a crisscross. Mm-hmm. And they hit each other with flying crossbodies perfectly, yeah. right in the middle of the ring. Both end up trading blows in the middle following that. They had a, this is what you were talking about earlier, the difference between spots and wrestling. Yeah. This was a spot match. Yeah. Neville is about to fly, but Tyson spots him getting up. So Neville sets up Tyson in the tree of woe on, on the other side to return to favors from earlier. Neville hits a top rope crossbody, and Regal is impressed with it. It was all right. We get a drop kick to Tyson Kidd on the outside, but Tyson hits a kick before Neville can fly. Tyson Kidd goes up for something and waits. And, I mean, this was an unnatural wait. Mm -hmm. He waited long enough for Neville to get up and then rush him off the top rope. Yeah. Tyson Kidd tries for a sunset flip off the top, but Neville just kind of flips Flipped away. out of it. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, flipped out of it and hit the power bomb following it. It looked – he flipped too much. It made it look unnatural. It was still a good spot, but he flipped a little too much out of it so that he could land on his feet that made it not really look right. And then but right then he followed it up with the beautiful powerbomb. But it only gets a two count. Yeah. A uh, few kicks to Tyson, and he gets a modified side rushing leg sweep off the second rope. Looks that, good. Yeah, that did look good. Tyson goes back up top, thinks better of it, jumps down for a sharpshooter. Neville finally gets out of it and goes for a suplex, but both dump outside to start the 10 count. Mm -hmm. And that was another little awkward spot. I couldn't quite figure out what was going on, so I guess they just both said, ah, screw it, let's dump outside. Yeah, it was weird. But they both get back in as the ref yells nine. So, eh. At this point, both of them look pretty gassed, man. Yeah. They're trading blows and chopping in the ring, and both of them look like they are on fumes. It was at this point, I feel like when they put the match together, they put together maybe a 10- or 12-minute match. 
And then they were told, nah, you got to stretch it to 20. Yeah, because this goes nearly 21 minutes. Tyson gets Neville into the sharpshooter and converts it into a dungeon lock, which I thought was a cool-looking move because that's actually the first time I saw that. Yeah, I, I immediately started writing down sharpshooter armbar, and then Regal yells out, it's the dungeon lock. And I was like, oh, that's an even better name for it than sharpshooter armbar. It looked really good. Neville finally grabs the rope for a rope break, which I thought was a little confusing here because it goes back to what you said. This was a 12-minute written out match that got extended to 21 minutes. Yeah. The rope is right there in front of him. He is staring at it. (laughs) He put him in the thing, and he was almost touching the ropes when he did it. Neville looks like a complete idiot at this point because he's just waving his arm around looking for a rope. He's staring at it, and he can't find it. Neville gets stuck up in the ropes, and Tyson hits a top rope flip onto Neville and drags him to the middle for a two count. Tyson goes back up. Neville tries to stop him, keeps climbing up, and launches Tyson to the middle of the ring, which is followed up by the red arrow, and that finally gets the win at 2055. This finish looked really good. Like, he chunked him with the Hurricane Rana. My only note is Kid could have gotten into place a little better. Like, you clearly see him move over into place. I retract that note because he was perfectly in place for Neville to do the Red Arrow. It looked great. After the match, you think we're about to get another Hug It Out spot, and I'm like, come on. There's too many of these. Same. But we get a little bit of psychology from Tyson as he blows Neville off and leaves. Yes. Carry on the feud as you should. You didn't get what you wanted. Try again. So I got a couple of notes for Tyson right now, and we'll go into more detail later on. Well, even at the end of this, though, I now have my sign of the night. Right behind Neville as he's doing this is a sign that says, Cast Neville for the next Hobbit movie. Jesus. (laughs) He's a troll. So Tyson Kidd. He's got some talent, right? Yes. He's another one, just like Natty, unfortunately, that he just gets tossed around based on storyline needs from one roster to another. See, I would argue a slight difference, though. I think Natty has charisma. I don't feel the charisma in Tyson. Like, I just don't really care. Yeah, I'm with you, but we, we don't have managers yet, so that's where we're stuck at with him. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're not too much longer for Tyson from this point on. I'm not going to go too into it because I know we'll see him again. Yeah, he's on the next pay-per-view in the main event. I'll just say that he's still employed by the WWE to this day, on and off. Neville sticks around for a little bit. Yeah, It it was, again, a little bit like the last show. Neville hung out in the ring for a good little bit after the match. It made me believe something else was about to happen, uh, but nothing did. So overall, what did you think of the show? Uh, Solid. I'd say probably about a four-star. I can't give the the whole show a five-star. I think the women's match is probably the best women's match that, especially at this time frame, that anybody's seeing out of women. I think the Tyler Breeze Sami Zayn match was really good. Not as good, like I said, as people made it out to be. And the main event was serviceable. It shouldn't have gone as long. And then the other opening matches, they did what they were supposed to do and quick and to the point. Nothing bad, except for the weird Lana Rusev spot. I didn't understand it. I don't know why it's there. The only thing that Mojo was missing was this 2 by 4 Yeah, it was it was weird. But that's really the only negative I have for the show. I thought after watching Arrival that this one was going to have a hard time topping it, but I think it succeeded in topping. They're definitely off to a great start with their specials, and I hope, and they're leading me to hope, that it will continue. Yeah. And yourself. I agree with you on the pay-per-view. We'll definitely see better shows to come, mm-hmm. but for technically a brand that's just now kicking off, This was great. One thing that you brought up that I want to touch on real quick, and this has nothing to do with our show or anything else like that. You gave this show a star rating, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just for everybody to know our personal opinion. Yeah. Now, like most of the people that are listening or will one day listen to our podcast, hopefully, you probably know who Dave Meltzer is. I do. And there's a reason that during our podcast, we don't really go into what stars did this get What does the dirt sheet say on this guy? Mm -hmm. Part of that is because it's an opinion. Yeah, it's all subjective. And the other reason of that is, is because before I went on this last trip, you and I sat down and we're going through some notes and some other wrestling news. And we found that Meltzer had just basically shit all over this one match in Japan. Mm -hmm. Said that not only was it a negative match, but it was also a match that you should avoid watching. And that if you become a wrestler... You should watch this to learn what not to do. To, to give him a little bit of fairness on that, he said it was either a five-star match or a negative five-star match. 
just out of morbid curiosity, because you know I like dumpster fires, right? Mm-hmm. I suggested to you that we actually sit down and watch this match because I wanted to see a train wreck. Right. Tell me about this match. So it was a New Japan match. It was Tetsuya Naito versus Kota Abushi, I think is how you pronounce it. And it was for the Intercontinental Championship, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. It was a great match. There was one spot that you could consider dangerous, but other than that, it was really well paced, really good storytelling. Uh, you really got the vibe that these two guys hated each other, and it was really well done. I, I don't see – even the spot wasn't that bad, so I, I, I can't understand a possible negative rating to this match. I was blown away by what was said about this match by him and other dirt sheet riders. Yeah, a lot of the internet community shat upon this match because of one spot, and whether or not that spot should have happened, it doesn't take away from the rest of the match. So yeah, I, I normally wouldn't put stars on a show. That's just my way of saying, I like this show. I recommend it. You should go watch it. You might hate it. You might love it. You might think it's even better. That's all we want to do. We want to tell you about some matches that are good. If you get a chance, go check them out. If you go check them out and we're wrong, tell us we're wrong. We're not going to be mad at you. Yeah, leave comments on the video. Hopefully one day we'll have this up on uh, other outlets for podcast. I definitely would recommend from this show, watch Natty and Charlotte. The rest of it, if you don't want to go out of your way, don't go out of your way. But Natty and Charlotte, it, it deserves to be watched. It was a really good match. So with that, we are done with the pay-per-view, and it leaves us with only one final task. All right. Kill of the show. Mm. Ballots are in. So let, let's hear it. What, who was heel of the night? Tyler Breeze, 100%. Uh, like I said, it was the little things. He didn't play evil heel. He played egotistical heel. And he did little things in that match. Like I said, the raking of the face. The I'll take the count out win because it doesn't matter. I'm getting a number one contendership match out of this. Yeah, I might have accidentally hit him in the balls, but I'm going to pin him and win anyways. Like, he just did the little things. He got it. He got the psychology. What's your choice? It was a tough one. But I'm going to have to go with Ric Flair on this one. Bret Hart was right across the ring. And you two have been writing about each other and crapping all over each other's careers for the last few years. You had your chance, Rick. You could have given us what we wanted. You could have beaten a scowl off his face. And yet you denied us. Heel turn of the week. Oh, he's not doing it to be a face. He's doing it strictly to be a heel oh, for me. He, not only, yeah, not even, not even to other fans, just to you. He will never give you what you want. Before we go, I have a couple of did you knows real quick. Ooh. We are three and a half years away from NXT War Games. Three and a half years. It's funny that you mention NWA War Games. I know you didn't. But <laughs> okay. you make me think of NWA War Games, right? Did this not have a Clash of the Champions feel, this whole pay-per-view? It kind of did. That old-school vibe of just, here's great wrestlers, watch them. Did you know that NXT War Games actually takes place in Houston? Of Texas? Yes, the God's Republic. The state that is a state and a country. And while it takes place in Houston, it's going to take a while for people to get ready for NXT War Games. But don't you worry, that boat will set sail in October of 2016. That's a long journey. So in two more years, we have two more months. As always, we appreciate you for sitting around and just listening to us, Jaw Jack, about NXT. We're fans. We hope you're fans, and we hope you'll be our fans. Hit like, subscribe. One day we'll have a podcast channel, and I'll come back and re-edit that in here. We have a Facebook and Twitter that we haven't quite figured out how to set up yet. We'll get there. We'll get there one day. We'll figure uh, out these internets, this whole fad. That's it for myself, Waldo. And I'm the Matt. And as always, we appreciate Dr. Brian sitting around and giving us insightful knowledge of what's going on here. Dr. Brian? Words to live by. <laughs>